Wilson Alzheimer's Institute and Center for Community Engagement and Health Partnership. Welcome to the eighth annual Minority Health Month event, Breaking the Silence, Addressing Dementia in Communities of Color, where this year's theme is systemic change through community. I'm Dr. Nia Norris and will be serving as your program facilitator for today's presentation, One Size Does Not Fit All, Our Culture is Our Strength and the Key to Alzheimer's Disease and Dementia Care. April is National Minority Health Month, and in April of 2001, the National Minority Health Month Foundation launched National Minority Health Month in response to Healthy People 2010 to promote educational efforts on the health problems currently facing minorities and other health disparity populations. Well, it is well past the 2010 initiative, and our communities continue to be impacted by health disparities. As many of you already know, dementia impacts communities of color at an alarming rate. African Americans are estimated to be two times more likely and Latinos one and a half times more likely to be diagnosed with some form of dementia. Today we have come together to continue to break the silence about this disease to educate our entire village as we learn from our own community how we can collectively work together to help our loved ones and our community families navigate through their journeys. We hope that today is a day of learning, hope, and encouragement. We know this is not the end, but rather another step on our pathway. At this time, I'd also like to thank our sponsors and partners who have played a key role in ensuring that we could host this dialogue today for our community. Bader Philanthropies, My Choice Wisconsin, Community Academic Aging Research Network, Direct Supply, and Milwaukee County Department of Health and Human Services, Aging and Disability Services. As we move into the presentation for today, I'd like to provide you with some housekeeping rules for engagement. If you have questions for the presenter, please utilize the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will get to as many questions as possible. And for any questions that we are unable to answer during today's presentation, we will post answers to those questions on the event page of our website. So now I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Maria Mora Pinzon. Dr. Mora Pinzon is board certified in preventive medicine and public health and is currently a research fellow at the UW-Madison Department of Family Medicine and Community Health and a scientist with the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute. She received her MD from the Universidad Central de Venezuela, Escuela Jose Maria Vargas, a master's in clinical research from Rush University, Chicago, Illinois, and completed residency at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2017. She has a leadership position in the American College of Preventative Medicine. She's co-founder of the Twitter community, hashtag Latinas in Medicine, and is a member of the health policy PIA of the Alzheimer's Association International Society to Advance Alzheimer's Research and Treatment. She is working in the intersection of health equity and implementation science in communities of color, particularly in topics affecting older adults, such as injuries, fall prevention, management of chronic diseases, and dementias. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Maura Pinzon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nia, for, well, Dr. Norris, for that presentation. And it's an honor for me to be here. And I hope we have a very nice conversation after I do this very, very brief introduction. So one size does not fit all. How many times have you seen a, something, a very nice top on the store or something that looks so cute? And you see, what size is this? Unique size. You already know that eh, this might not be for me. Same thing happens in many aspects of research and healthcare. And I think we're going to talk about more about why that does not work for us. First, I have a couple of disclosures. I have received funding from different organizations, including the University of Wisconsin, the Department of Medicine. Uh, I have uh, the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center through the Rex Scholars Program and also through a HERSA grant uh, that's supporting the Primary Care Research Fellowship at the University of Wisconsin. 
But now let's get to the point. How Alzheimer's disease and related dementias affect communities of colors? And I think Dr. Norris mentioned the, what we know. <clears throat> communities of color, we are more likely to suffer of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. When, when you Google Alzheimer's disease, this is what we get. We do not see ourselves represented. When I started working in Alzheimer's disease <clears throat> five, six years ago, I came to the field thinking, Latinos do not get Alzheimer's. Lo and behold, Latinos are 1.5 times more likely to develop Alzheimer's. And I didn't know that. And I'm a physician. How many people don't know that? How many people that we trust, that we rely on, don't know that? And as I was, was mentioned already, Black African-American population are two times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. What's more worrisome is that the numbers are going up. By 2060, the number of people that have Alzheimer's disease in the United States is going to expect to triple. But just around the corner, just in less than 10 years, we expect that 40% of all of those with Alzheimer's disease are going to be Latino, Black, African-American, and that's worrisome because we are not prepared. We are not prepared to provide the best care that we can to our communities, and we need to start preparing. We need to start getting all the pieces together to make sure that everybody receives the care that they deserve, that they need when they need it. But let's start with the first question. What are the causes? Um, when people ask me about this, um, including some reporters, the first question is, is this genetics? Is this genetics, right? And it takes more than genetics. This is a framework by the National Institute of Aging Health. Uh, this is the National Institute of Aging Health Disparities Research Framework. It shows that when we have these differences in health and health outcomes, there are multiple factors. It's not only genetics. There's behavioral, there's sociocultural factors, there are environmental factors. And we think about how many of these things are related to each other. How your socioeconomic status and how far could you go in education really determines what type of jobs you have, your income, what food you eat, it's very hard to eat healthy when, when we, have, we are living paycheck by paycheck. It's really hard to, I'm going to just take a time for myself to exercise and do certain things when you are ha having to work two jobs or 12, 14 hours. So there's many things that are interconnected and it's important to realize that when we talk about what's the causes of Alzheimer's disease. But the first thing I want to say to everybody here, race is not the risk factor. Racism is the risk factor. We are not broken. It's not like we, because of who we are, we automatically is going to have more Alzheimer's disease. That's not the case. But you might say, well, but is genetics associated? Yes. We know that there are genetic factors associated with Alzheimer's disease. We know that there are certain uh, alleles, there are certain genes that might increase the risk. But what we don't know is if that's connected to race or ethnicity. There's been some studies where they show, oh yeah, this gene is associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. But when they expand their research and go to different populations, that's not there. The APOE gene has been associated with Alzheimer's disease, mostly in white population studies. When they increase the sample size, when they got more people involved in research to look at these genetic factors, there's how important that gene is was a little controversial, particularly in some Latino studies, we might have seen that yes, there was association or no. So there's a still a lot of 
things that we don't know. We know that genetics are associated, but genetics does not mean race. Again, race is not the risk factor. Racism is the risk factor. Our genes, the way that our body works, change based on our environment. If we are exposed to more pollutants, if we have to work more, if we have more stress, all of these things affect how our body works. And that is where the risk comes. So I'll go a little deeper. What are the causes? Well, the first thing that we know is that most likely these differences that Latinos and African-Americans are more likely to have Alzheimer's disease is related to chronic conditions, heart disease, high blood pressure, stroke, diabetes. And we have a, key, a couple of graphs on the right side. We know that African-Americans are more likely to die at early ages from all causes. And they are more likely to have diabetes and high blood pressure and strokes. And these are the factors that we know increase the risk of having Alzheimer's disease. Among Latinos, we are more likely to have uncontrolled high blood pressure. That again, one of the most important factors to develop in Alzheimer's disease. When we take in consideration these factors, they are one of the most important causes that our communities are seeing the impact of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Things that happen for many, many years before we start seeing the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. But what other factors are there? Um, according to a recent publication, about 40% of the cases of uh, dementia could be prevented, 40%. Um, let's explore some of the things that are important. The first one, education. The higher you go in schooling, the less chances you have to develop in dementia or the later it will show up. Education, something that starts when we are three, four years old. That's a huge protective factor. Other things, hearing loss. 8% of the, all the dementia cases in the world could be solved if everybody could get access to a hearing aid. Hearing loss, something that sounds so simple. Hypertension, we already talked about that one. Obesity. And let's go back to education. If you have to quit your, your, if you have to drop out of high school to help at home, to help family, if you have to start taking a job early um, in life and start working, you have less chances of getting a good paying job later in life. You have less chances of getting the freedom to really decide How's your lifestyle going to be? You will be doing the best that you can with the tools that you have. But that means that we are getting a disadvantage from the beginning. Smoking, this is something that's affect uh, dementia. Depression, social isolation, physical inactivity, air pollution, diabetes. All of these things affairs of communities are more likely to affect our communities than other ones. We know about redlining, how many of our communities are built in locations that don't have the best air quality. And then we see that every day, there are multiple factors that are increasing the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And this could be tackled. I'm not mentioning genetics. This is not a low, uh, this is not, um, problem that doesn't have a solution. There are many things that we can do. And that's why we're here, right? And that's what we are talking, how we make sure that our communities get better, get healthier. 
But there's many other things that affect our communities. And these are the disparities in care. Our communities are less likely to receive a diagnosis, less likely to receive treatment, less likely to access support services, more likely to be cared at home by unpaid caregivers. And particularly for Latinos, we develop Alzheimer's disease symptoms earlier, about seven years earlier than white population. What does this mean? Well, this means that we have a long way to go. But we're getting there. We're working on it. And now to the point of the presentation, or culture or strength. What's culture? Anything that you can imagine, that's culture. For me, this is my food. This is my typical food. This is a pavellon, what you see in the corner. It's rice, beans, and meat. It's about the music. It's about dancing. It's about salsa, merengue, tambor. It's about our traditions of getting together. That's culture. And each one of us has those unique traditions that when we tap into that, when we get connected to our culture, things are better. And we know it. And this is a survey from the Alzheimer's disease when Individuals, about 3,000 individuals were asked, how important is for you that a healthcare provider understands your racial uh, and ethnic background? 80, 90% of people, regardless of race or ethnicity, they said, yeah, that's very important for me. We see Hispanic Americans, 85%. The Black Americans, 89%. Asian Americans, 84%. Native Americans, 92%. Everybody agrees, this is important to me and my care. But we cannot get that everywhere. And that's where the disconnect starts to happen. Only 59% of Hispanic Americans are confident that they might find somebody that understands them. Only 48% of Black Americans, 63% of Asian Americans and 47% of Native Americans. That tells me that there's a lot of people out there that they have never had a chance to have an honest conversation with their doctor or their nurse practitioner or their nurse. And that's sad. And that's sad because even no matter how high you go on the ladder, that might still happen. I'm a Latina physician, I'm bilingual. I don't have to worry about not understanding many things. And I still have never had a doctor that looks like me or a doctor that really understands where I'm coming from. But then what does it mean understanding? And these are some quotes that I have collected over the past couple of years in one of my studies. When I ask people, um, what do they think about the care that we receive? What's important to them? And that's related to Alzheimer's disease and dementia. We take care of our own. Is the taking care of our families, taking care of our grandparents or parents or aunts or uncles. That's my job. That's my responsibility. I was born with that task. It's not a burden. And that's the first thing. I never heard the word burden. I never heard the, this as a, something that I didn't want to do. It was a matter of pride. It's honor. This is my tradition. And understanding that is very, very important. What does the older adults say? It is shameful and sad when somebody's sick and they take it to a nursing home. They are all alone in there. It is very sad. Let's go a little deeper. One doctor said that we needed to find a nursing home for my mom. We never went back. We never went back. That's what it means understanding. Not only that, oh yeah, it's your Latina. Is that how does this gonna affect what we're going to do in the future? What are the goals? What do you wanna see? That's one of the things that means understanding us and understanding the culture. 
and let's go a little deeper. Having a healthcare provider that looks like us is important. We are more likely to receive preventive care. There are several studies of um, black men seen, being seen by primary care providers that were also black men. 60% of this, um, this men said, oh, when the doctor offered the flu shot, I took it. When the doctor offered to check my cholesterol, I did it. I trust him. We're more likely, when we have somebody that looks like us, we're more likely to bring up new complaints. And I always tell this to every physician that I see. If you ask a Latino older adult, how are you doing? They will not say fine. They don't want to be complaining about things. But they might think that many things are normal. So if they say, how are you doing? And they say, fine. But then you start asking, any pain today? Oh yeah, my, my hip has been hurting. How's your, how are the kids at home? Well, you know, it's been a stressful. So sometimes we need, really need to bring up those new complaints. What are the things that many people might think are normal or they're okay, but they're not. More likely to continue follow-up care. That's another one that we just saw before. We never went back. If we can trust that somebody is going to respect our choices or our values, we're more likely to come back. And we are more likely to get an agreement what's the best course of action for us. And then, but let's go deeper. Having access that has been designed for us is important. And I'm going to use several examples. Increase access. I remember once somebody told me, oh, but let's do a um, booklet with information about Alzheimer's disease. We can leave it in some, we can do it in Spanish and put it in some libraries. And I told them, I don't know really how frequently Latinos go to the libraries here, but that's not where I will put it. Where I will put it in places where Latinos go every single day, the market, the church, the school of their kids, all of those places that really speak to us. And that's the first thing. Access means being where people is, not making them go out of their way to get care. When care programs and care are designed for us, we increase the usefulness and relevancy. We make sure that they are useful when they need it, not six, five, eight years later. We minimize redundancies. We decrease the waste of resources. I want you to think about now, how many times you had a blood work done that you needed to repeat? because your doctors do not communicate with each other. Because maybe for the insurance that you have, you needed to see a specialist that was out of network. Our insurance company couldn't think that we might need this specialist. When we have care that's assigned for us, it's a streamline. We don't need to talk a thousand doors and waste a thousand hours get into where we need to be. And think about all the time and effort that it takes to make one doctor's appointment, one. How many phone calls you might need? How many rearranges of the schedule? Figure out who's gonna take you. Every time that I need to go to take my mom to the doctor, of course, I like, okay, I need to take the day off. And thank God I can do that. But not everybody can. And it's all the times that I need to go to phone calls. Like, okay, where is it? What time is it? How much do I need to prepay? All of those questions. That's time, that's effort, that's money. Even after we get all of these things done, sometimes we live with that flavor on your mouth. <sighs> I wish it could have been better. When we have care that's designed for us, we feel better and we are happier. We have improved satisfaction with the services. 
we are more likely to get more better services. We are more likely to continue the services. So this is one, the first things, all cultural strength. When we tap into our culture and the things that are important to us, these things will come. Taking the time to making sure that the care is culturally appropriate. It's not a waste of time. It's not a waste of resources. And anybody that thinks that is not a friend because we know it works. And I'm going to give you now three examples of three programs that I admire a lot. I have nothing to do with them, but I admire it. But, and they're an example of how we use all culture to advance the things that we know. This is the first one. Latinos Against Alzheimer's launched this campaign with the University of Kentucky about three or four years ago. It's about using the movie Coco to promote conversations uh, in families about Alzheimer's disease and dementia. The campaign was called, Who is Your Coco? So we start by the understanding who are families and making those connections. Our families probably have been touched by Alzheimer's, even if we don't mention it. So the conversation started by realizing this is already affecting us. Who is that family member that you are connected to? And thinking about other generations. So the picture that I'm showing you is an altar in Dia de los Muertos. We have pictures of different family members that have passed and we honor them. So this campaign really appear, uh, was trying to make that connection that talking about Alzheimer's is about honoring us or families and honoring those that come after us. The Amazing Grace Chorus that's done by the Milwaukee Office of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute. We, our cultures thrive in connection, in connectivity. They thrive by being together and helping each other. Um, I really, 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 really can, don't have enough good words to say about the chorus. And I enjoy everybody that's here to take a look at the amazing work that they're doing. There are several other similar strategies around the United States. But if you wanna see the chorus, uh, actually they're presented tomorrow on YouTube. You can look at the information online. The chorus includes uh, people with dementia or microcognitive impairment and also the family members. And when you listen to them, it's like you're in heaven. It's the, the, the experience is not only helpful for those that are in the chorus, but also for those of us that are listening. It's about creating that connection and making us feel part of this community. But also something important in our communities is our religion and spirituality. And I wanna share this program by uh, Dr. Farron Epps about how to make our faith communities better equipped to helping those with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And give me one second, I need to put the sound. And this will take one minute. First memories that come to mind of attending church is being at church every day of the week <laughs> with my grandma. Oh, sorry. First memories that come to mind of attending church is being at church every day of the week <laughs> with my grandmother. That's just how it was. I'm Dr. Fayron Epps, program lead for ALTER, also an assistant professor at Emory University. Throughout my work doing research in the community, specifically with the African-American community, I came to realize that a lot of people didn't know that this existed. They was unaware of what dementia was. We learned so much about living with dementia and uh, how it affects the person and the family. Think of a program that is connecting the dots for people living with dementia, their caregivers, and their spirituality. 
The ALSA program has really helped me to educate not only the myself, but also the members of our church. It keeps me whole and it gives me a strength that sometimes I need. We don't know who God is going to send to our churches, but we've got to be ready for everyone that he sends. Um, I invite you to check their website, altarmensha.com. Um, I follow them on Twitter and a couple of social networks, trying to always learn how we can make every space a better space for our communities. Well, we have talked about a lot of what we think and our communities think, but now what we national stakeholders think about this? Well, this is the topic for this month's um, National Minority Health Month. Give your community a boost. Community. There is growing recognition about the role of our communities have in our health. This means that there's been a few more opportunities for grants and funding to support community initiatives. There's been an increased use of community advisory boards in different healthcare settings. I think many organizations now have their own. And there's been an increased recognition of the need to engage community leaders, organizations, and programs around research and health health services for Alzheimer's disease. But let's explore a little bit more of that. What does it mean an increased recognition? For dementia care, uh, there's been um, a lot of initiatives on how to promote that coalition building, how to promote those partnerships that's going to support the care that happens in each community. And even there's been specifically documents and plans designed for Native American communities. And this is an example here. This increased recognition has been trying to decentralize. There's been more and more initiatives that, that are maybe looking for one organization to direct the work, but that the work happens at the community level. And this means that there's more resources and more opportunities for our community to get involved. We do not need uh, people that come and goes and then never think of the community. We want to build, we want to support the things that are happening in our community. And I think there's more and more, I've seen more and more plans that get in us there. But then let's talk about research because what's the role of all culture in Alzheimer's disease research? There's been an increased recognition of the role of culture, particularly in recruiting and engaging participants in clinical studies. I think this is where most of the conversations have been happening and we're going to talk about, about what I think about that in a minute. <laughs> and we know that this is a problem. This has been a problem for a long time. Currently, less than 10% of the clinical trial cohorts include Black, Latino, Native Americans, Asian American populations. We are almost 40% of the United States but we represent less than 10% of the people in clinical trials. How do we know that the research that's happening will be beneficial for us, will be acceptable for us if we are not part of the research? And this is particularly sad when we see studies like new medications going to the market. This is one medication that was recently approved for Alzheimer's disease that has been a lot of controversy around. Out of the 3,285 participants, only 19 were Black or African-American. 19, less than 1% of the study. And everybody I think has agreed that this is shameful, that we need to make the work to make sure that our communities feel not only represented, but safe they feel secure, they trust the process. And if we are not building those stepping stones, it's not just about getting numbers. And that's the role of communities in research. It's about putting the pieces together to build our community, to build these resources, to get the resources that we need to stay healthier. It's not about just numbers. It's not the communities are not just there to be a recruitment site. Na na na. 
It's about making sure, and this is a role for institutions and researchers like me, is our role and our job to make sure that the communities are respected, welcome, and their priorities met. I have seen studies that, and I'll give you an example. They say, oh, we want to see what's the role of an ingrown toenail on diabetes. Okay, that sounds nice, but that's what we community needs. My communities is not coming to me saying, hey, I have a problem with an ingrown toenail. My community is coming to me saying, hey, I can order pro pro uh, afford my insulin. The role of research is making sure that every time we learn something new, those results, those benefits are coming back to the community. And the first time I heard this was here, Breaking the Silence 2018. And I want to recognize the work of all the Milwaukee office, Gina Green Harris, Dr. Nia Norris, Stephanie Houston, Gail Morgan, Selena Ramsey, and I think I'm missing a couple of pictures here. Your work was the first time I heard bringing the results of the things that we know to our community. And every day I learn from them. And every day I see how research can increase the community assets, can benefit the community now, not 10 years from now. And to conclude, there's many things that we don't know, but we, but we do know is that we are connected and that we are here to support each other. But that's the first thing. Every time that we support our communities, every time that we tap into our culture, we feel more connected, we feel happier, we feel a sense of purpose. And that's what I was hoping to share today. Do not feel afraid if, well, in this journey, people say that's not what we do. Maybe that's not what they do. But many times that's what we need to do. And making sure that your voices are heard. And that's my job every day. Every time that somebody mentions something I, um, about how to provide care or how they have experience providing care, it's about sharing that knowledge through generations. There's no right or wrong way to do things as long as our community feels happy and receive a benefits of the things that we're doing. And I hope I didn't disappoint. I really appreciate everybody of you that's been here. And I'm happy that we have some time for questions and to talk. So thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, um, Maria. This was just absolutely um, a wonderful presentation that you presented this morning um, in the chat. We're seeing very powerful, love this. Um, once again, just wonderful information. Um, I do have a few questions for you um, presented in your presentation today. And you mentioned that um, communities of color are less likely to receive diagnosis, treatment, and um, sometimes even seek resources for support. So why is that? Can you share a little bit about why that might be the case? Well, that's uh, one of the, the, the many things that, well, I think each community is different and I'm going to share what I have learned from the Latino community. So we have a perception that maybe memory issues, that's normal aging, that's normal. I mean, you know, I am starting to forget things that's gonna happen. So that's the first step when a lot of people might not be recognizing um, that there's an issue and seeking care. But most of the times, actually, what I've seen is that they know that there's an issue. They don't know who to ask. And we go back to having uh, providers that look like us, or people that understand us. Nobody has ever mentioned that this is an issue. And, or when they, my, my community goes to the doctor, they get things like, oh, you know what? We don't have anybody that speaks Spanish that can do that diagnosis. So they never get a diagnosis because hey, nobody could do the testing necessary. And when you don't have the testing, the diagnosis, then you cannot access the resources. How many programs do you require an official diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in order to get enrolled? 
how many times in order to get family care to be admitted uh, to, to get in an adult daycare center you need an official physician's recommendation but if you don't have that first step somebody that telling you yeah this is not normal we need to do something about it it breaks down and i know that there's many many other factors like cost time of the offices a specialized care um I think all the stars on how are we communicating with our communities that there's something that can be done. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that many, many, many caregivers are doing this job on their own. Um, I hope every single time that we do an event or we do a lecture, I wanna say, you're not alone. There's things that we can do to help. There's a lot of resources out there. Yes, it's a lot of paperwork. Yes, it's hard. Yes, there's a lot of red tape, but nobody should go through this journey on their own. Thank you. Um, you also made some very powerful statements that I think have really helped um, to formulate the discussion today around Minority Health Month and just working within communities of color. And one of them was about family goals, especially for families who are trying to navigate caring for their loved one living with dementia. And so what are some tips or what advice would you have for families that you can share about how to start that discussion with their provider? That's a very, 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 very important question. And I think, well, the first one, find a provider that hears you. That's the first step. Am I saying never go back? No, I'm saying change doctors or change providers because it's a long life journey. And it's gonna, this is not, you need somebody that will be hearing and listening what you need and giving you the advice in a non judgmental manner. For many of our communities, the goal is to keep our elders at home for as long as we can. Um, and until God allows us, then give us license. That's the trans, roughly translation from Spanish. So what do we need? And there's, I think there's a growing recognition about resources on how do we help and give the skills to the caregivers. Um, I, want, uh, I want to say here is never be afraid of asking. Um, maybe this is asking to somebody that's not your doctor, but somebody that is offering something in the community. Here in Wisconsin, I have to say there's the no wrong door policy. So that's very helpful because that means that many times if somebody doesn't know, they at least connect you to somebody that might know. So if the goal is that, hey, I really need an adult daycare for certain days, um, ask. Um, just, uh, and sometimes you might not have the word, but don't feel afraid of asking. And some the ways that I have heard adult daycare mentioned before, for example, is people saying, I need somebody to take a look at my mom two, three hours, well, a couple of times a week while I go do running some errands. That's the role of an adult daycare. Um, so it's very hard to find information sometimes, but the first step is that there's things out there and we will do, and here's everybody that works in the mesh. We always do the best to connect you with the right information. But the first step in this journey is ask, what can I do? Don't, you're not alone. Wonderful, thank you. And one of the last questions I have for you, um, your slide indicated um, that African-Americans, Latino, Asian population, American Indian population, there was a slide about how important it is to have providers that look like the community and the confidence um, in being able to connect with one. So what would you say needs to be done to close that gap and increase representation? We can stay two hours talking about that. <laughs> but I'll, let me share uh, I think you mentioned at the beginning uh, about Latinas in medicine. So to close that gap in representation, we need to support of youth more. And we, we and here is the institution, organizations, PI, we need to use our resources to make sure that they can get there. Um, many don't know, you cannot be what you cannot see. So representation matters. If you don't see anybody that's doing the job, how you don't, how will you know that that's gonna happen? But that's just the first step of the way. It's about making sure that we have the resources to support them. 
scholarships. We have um, part-time jobs or no jobs, full scholarships with additional housing, things that or, or youth can really dedicate the time and effort to get there. It's a very long road. Um, Latinas in Medicine, the Twitter community is about telling everybody you can do it and sharing some of those resources. Every time that we see a scholarship, like, hey, people apply. There's a lot of things that happen, like how do I even do a PhD? How do I apply to med school? How do, and connecting the, uh, our community, the youth community to those members of community that are there to mentor and help the gap. And I wanna highlight right now, a lot of the work that I know about mentorship is being done in Madison, Dr. Patricia Tellez Giron and the Latino Health Council, the Palma students. I've seen how this takes years. The Dr. Tellez Giron teach me every day of the value of mentorship, sometimes goes way beyond just here's the resources that you need. It goes about, I understand where you are. I know how hard it is and you can do it. Those simple words are extremely important and they are just one of the little pieces. And I like to always say, again, it's a long journey and we cannot do it alone. Thank you. Um, I do have a question from the audience. Um, they'd like to know, has the pandemic complicated this already tenuous situation? Yes, yes, yes. Um, one of the first things that we heard was the change to everything virtual. Though some communities were able to move resources and lectures and opportunities virtual, many communities could not adapt. And that's, I, I'm going to now speak particularly the Latino community. The first thing that we saw, well, most people don't have access to internet. Oh, I'm going to get, I, I, don't, I need to get to my doctor or make an appointment that is virtual. I only have a cell phone, but doesn't have enough bandwidth to do a whole video conference visit. So there's been a lot of care that has been delayed. There's a lot of care that has not happened. There's way more social isolation. And we have been trying to fight it through virtual programs, phone calls, and other activities, but we know it's not the same. And remember, one of the causes of Alzheimer's disease and dementia one of the things that contributes to that social isolation. These last two years still have made, we don't know what's the impact or all of us, all even young people, we really don't know that. And it's gonna take some time to figure that out, but the pandemic certainly has made us realize many things about access and availability, but also how to plan for the future. Absolutely. Um, definitely appreciate um, what you shared today in regards to um, very innovative ways to connect with people and culture. You mentioned um, the Latinos Against Alzheimer's, hashtag who is your COCO, um, the amazing Grace Chorus through our organization, uh, the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute Regional Milwaukee office, and then really connecting through faith and spiritualism with alter inspiring and equipping faith communities. And so uh, we want to encourage everyone, just like you mentioned in your presentation, to reach out to resources like those and to be able to connect with them. Um, and upon conclusion of our presentation today, um, if you are interested in learning more about our office and, and resources that are available to yourself as a caregiver or someone living with dementia, we encourage you to please visit our website at wai.wis.edu forward slash Milwaukee. And in closing, of course, we want to thank Dr. Maura Pinzon for the wonderful presentation today. And just thank you all for joining us. And upon conclusion of this presentation, we ask that you please take time to complete our evaluation that should either show up either in a new window once you leave Zoom, or it will be sent to you via email and your input to our programs is valuable. So we ask that you please complete these surveys so that we can continue serving the community in the best way possible. And on behalf of the WAI Regional Milwaukee office, we hope that you enjoyed today's session and look forward to seeing you at our next presentation on Monday, April 25th at 11.30 a.m. So thank you all and have a wonderful day.